Hi everybody, it's Will from Will Alexander's Dog Show Tips. This week on the interview chair we have B.A. Betty Ann's Denmark. Let's find out what Betty Ann's been up to. Hi, Betty Ann. It's good to see you. You look great. Good to see you, too. <laughs> Life is crazy right now, isn't it? It certainly is. It's nothing like I've ever lived before, that's for sure. It's, uh, it has no structure. I, I grow vegetables and dandy dinmonts. That's about all I do. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Well, I'm going to get right into the interview if you're comfortable and ready, then. I am. Okay. Can you tell me how you first got involved in the sport of dogs, or just dogs in general? Well, I grew up with a sort of English cocker that cost my family 35 bucks. And I can remember my dad getting a speeding ticket on the way home. I'm a five-year-old in the back seat, and he's telling him he's rushing to get home because we just got a new puppy. So Henry was my introduction to dogs. And as a young married woman, I had always wanted a St. Bernard. And we were living on Vancouver on Vancouver Island and there were two litters and thankfully I went to the other one <laughs> and it was a well-bred litter of uh, Rokerest and Shagbark breeding instead of the local, local puppy mill. So that was my first St. Bernard and uh, she was a pretty decent bitch. We finished her easily enough and uh, then I met Roy Stenmark when I drove all the way from North Vancouver to Kalamazoo, Michigan with my St. Bernard that I brought from Switzerland. You drove? He had a heart, well I drove. He had a heart issue and I didn't want to fly. And you know, this is a one hell of a long time ago. I'd, I would have had no idea how to dr fly a St. Bernard in those days. And uh, when I got there, there'd been an overload. Uh, John Stanick and Larry Stanbridge had overdrawn and some guy by the name of Roy Stenmark had been hired. And it was back in the days when the overload went to the judge who had the smallest entry. So there were plenty of dogs, there were some 200 plus bitches, and best of breed competition was 48. Wow. And that was Roy Stenmark's first judging assignment. Oh my. <laughs> and so I said, who the hell's Roy Stenmark? And, uh, of course, I only had a class dog, and I had no hope of getting that far, so a mutual friend introduced us, and the rest is history, as they say. What year was that, Betty? 1974. Don't do the math. <laughs> <laughs> I was old enough to drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so I was at the uh, St. Bernard National Specialty in Kalamazoo, Michigan in 1974, and met Roy Stenmark, who in those days was the overload judge because the two published judges, John Stanick and Larry Stanbridge had overdrawn. And back in those days, the overload judge got the smallest entry of class dogs, class bitches, or best of breed competition. So there was a couple of hundred dogs and maybe 300 bitches. This was back in the St. Bernard heyday, and 48 specials. So this guy, I said, who the hell's Roy Stenmark? His first judging assignment ever was best of breed competition at the St. National, <laughs> 48 specials. I mean, great assignment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, who wouldn't freeze today with that audition? <laughs> so <laughs> he never lacked confidence. And <laughs> I'm sure many of the winners panicked back in those days because he was never a proponent of the big headed, short legged, overdone St. Bernard's. He liked a tall athletic mountain rescue dog. So he ended up with kind of an in-between one. It was a very, very nice dog. So anyway, a friend of mine introduced me to him because she knew that my class dog was never gonna to get to his best of breed competition. And when I got home, my phone was ringing and it was this guy, Roy Stenmark, <laughs> hoping I was gonna to come to California sometime, which as you well know, when you live in British Columbia, coming to California is not something you do every day, not back in those days. So I blandly told him, 
uh, planes do fly in both directions, you know. So anyway, he came. <laughs> and uh, that, that was uh, some whirlwind romance from uh, May of 74. We were married in March of 75. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't afford the long distance romance. <laughs> it was expensive. <laughs> yeah. So what from from there, when did the dandies come then? Or the dandies came after Roy was judging Saints and I was about to judge Saints. At that time I was working for the all breed Australian judge by the name of Peter B. Thompson. And Peter gave me a recommendation to the American Kennel Club that they should approve me. And that, that happened very quickly. Uh, Peter had a lot of clout back in those days. So um, me, were, you, were, you, were you already a judge up in Canada when this happened? No, no, no. Okay. I was a, just a simple girl, an exhibitor from North Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know how all this worked, but I learned. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, uh, I started judging Saints and Roy did, and we decided that showing a breed that we were both judging really wasn't kosher. And we were looking at having a smaller dog. So Lorna Rindle in West Vancouver had a two-year-old adult dandy Dinmont bitch before my friend June Monahan, who was the Burkefell Border Terrier lady in Abbotsford, had an adult Border, border Terrier bitch, and the rest is history, as they say. So that was in March of 75, and I think Bess came later that year, walked into our house and had my cat by the head before we could <laughs> close the front door. How he died of natural causes, I don't know, because that was one gamey bitch. <laughs> so that began the lifelong uh, romance with the Dandy Dinmont Terrier, and it's been a lot of fun. Who, who mentored you in that breed then? Who would you consider your mentor in the in the sport, like in dandies? Well, even so, in the sport. So, I guess. Well, Roy. yeah, you know, Roy was twenty years my senior, but uh, our experience in dogs was pretty much the same. So, my real mentor in dogs was Jean Lyle, oh, the oh, Wycliffe, wow. yes, the Wycliffe Standard Poodle breeder of quite some fame. Yes, and Don. Lyle and my dad were in the same industry, in the insurance industry, and we knew the Lyles as social friends. And I can remember being in Europe buying a St. Bernard dog, and my mother telling Jean that, oh, Betty Ann's buying a St. Bernard in Europe. And Jean says, I hope she doesn't think she's gonna make any money at this. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what my mother might have said to have prompted that. <laughs> And boy, was she right. <laughs> As you all well know, our very expensive hobby, but yeah. I wouldn't rate it for anything. I think golf's kind of dull, but, and curling was infinitely dull, <laughs> even <laughs> though I did. <laughs> so uh, that was my main mentor in dogs. And she was a really good mentor because that was a highly inbred line of standard poodles that you could pick out anywhere in the world. You can. Yeah, if they go back to her dogs. You can pick them out. I know you can. I mean, she actually had laid back shoulders with an upper arm to match with the front legs not coming out of their throat. <laughs> <laughs> they were more like sporting dogs, really. Well, they, you know, they were a sporting dog for sure. Yes, yeah, so she was a great mentor and I learned a lot. And through the years, I've had quite a number of mentors. I have to say Rick Beauchamp was a very influential person for me. I met him later in life, and I can remember we were on the same panel somewhere in Minnesota, and he sat down beside me and he says, our friends all say we'll have a lot of fun together. And that was my introduction to Rick. And he was a really thought provoking person. And he taught me a lot about judging, about judging the overall picture and not getting hung up in one area to the detriment of the rest of the dog and so on. He was a great mentor. And a, a really, I miss him to this day. I think the dog world misses him. Yeah. We had some great conversations. So. Yes. Yep. So those were probably my two, my early mentor. In St. Bernard's, I really didn't have anybody that was really leading me along the way, but I was kind of a smart ass kid in those days and probably wouldn't have listened. <laughs> <laughs> One does learn along the way. And in Dandies, um, they're really 
was no one person who really stood out that had a picture in their mind. And Roy and I were far along in dogs to realize what we were doing. And having a dog that had the right front assembly and the true achondroplastic uh, characteristics in check, that was very important to us. So our original bitch had a great front, a beautiful side gate. She had an old fashioned English head. She had a lousy coat, <laughs> but she was a hell of a dog. She had great breed character and she was a good place to start. And we were lucky enough to also acquire her granddaughter who was, who was better than she was. And between the two of them, they were a good foundation. And like everybody who breeds a rare breed, we struggle to find another dog to breed to. Long-term plans are not really how it works in our breed. You wanna breed a bitch, you look around to see who at the moment might be a dog that can help. Not easy. I'm sure, well, you've done a good job. There's no question about that. Um, well, in judging, um, so before I get to that part, what's your favorite breed? Are dandies your favorite breed then? Yeah, they're my favorite breed to live with, but I have to say I am always thrilled when I get to judge a Whippet and a major entry, and I have a great love of Pembroke Welsh Corgis, okay. which of course have a lot of similarities, and if I'd realized you didn't have to groom them like we have to groom a dandy, I might have taken a different path. <laughs> but those are probably two of my most favorite breeds. There are, and of course, Dachshund, which I have a great affinity for that's, but the long and low are kind of my specialty. Yeah, it seems like where that's a true. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. You're seeing Bernard's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, except for that. <laughs> um, you have a favorite dog that you, you've bred, that you look back that at? I've bred? Or, or owned, or owned, doesn't matter. Oh yeah, yeah, there's a couple of bitches that have been great favorites. Um, Kings Mountain Angelina Ballerina was a hell of a lot of fun to own and show. She uh, gave us a lot of pleasures. And her daughter, uh, Prima Ballerina, was just another beautiful dandy. And then there's one that only went as far as becoming a champion, Veronica Valentine, who ended up being a really important producer. So yeah, the list goes on. <laughs> and they've, they've gotten pretty good in the last... 10, 15 years, I think I'm finally breeding what I've always been looking to breed all along. But of course, unlike most people, I don't think it just happens in a generation or two. Oh. And we've been, been selecting for the same characteristics for many, many years. And it's paying off now. So as, as a judge, what year did you start judging Betty Ann? <laughs> 1978. <laughs> I, as I said, I was a smart ass kid, <laughs> but I was married to somebody 20 years my senior. So I had lots of introductions to things that most young people wouldn't have. And I started out with St. Bernard's, you know, back in those days, you had to judge them five times, three times as a provisional, and then three more times to establish yourself as a regular judge. Then you were allowed to apply for one more breed which for me was Saluki's because I'd ended up living with Richard and Barbara Webster and their son, Mark, the RA Saluki people in Aldergrove, British Mark Columbia. Webster from up here? I know Mark. Yes, yes, Mark from up there. <laughs> <laughs> Don't laugh too hard. <laughs> we all have history. <laughs> so I anyway. I, loved, I remember following Mark around. He was a good handler. Mark was a yes, he handler. was. And he handled my St. Bernard's, which has how that connection was made all those years ago. And so I had a terrific introduction to Saluki's. And uh, I can remember flying to New York to judge my second Saluki assignment, which was hard to come by. There were two, and I didn't like either one of them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I go back, I bred one litter of Saluki's. Richard and Barbara had given us a really nice dog as a wedding present, and of course, being breeders, we acquired a really nice matching bitch for him. But I found placing puppies responsibly was so difficult. Mm -hmm. It was damn near impossible. And I can remember the sixth dog of that litter almost living out the rest of his life with us. And we had really moved on there and we were not set up for them. And so we became Saluki fanciers in a hurry. And I still have a great love for the breed. I just oh, think yes. they're beautiful. Just beautiful. 
Yeah. I love showing them. I love them having them around. They were just, they're almost like having a cat. <laughs> you know, yes. So. yes, they are. Absolutely. I loved it. Yep. So, so who would you consider your judging mentors then? Uh, probably Roy Stanmark to start with. Um, you know, he was such a methodical, thoughtful person and presented some things to me that, you know, I hadn't really thought about. Um, and I think between us, we kind of refined our style of judging and found the things that worked. And one of the great things he said to me was, you've got to take it out far enough. You can't just make your decision. You have to allow all the dogs to show themselves well enough so you're making the best decision. Of course, we all screw up. <laughs> There's plenty of times I look at my finger and ask it, what the hell were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> and anybody who doesn't think so is not thinking about this so much. But that he was a very early mentor. And another one was Florence Mails, who was our AKC rep oh, okay. for many years in this area. And actually, Sydney Good was the first. She was Sydney Monteleone back in those days. And Northern California was her first assignment as a field rep. Well, I didn't know and, that. Yeah, we were pretty good friends. I can remember coming her coming onto the DelVal match and looking around asking who's Roy and Betty Ann Stenmark because we were the only licensed judges on the grounds that day. But, and she had an influence on me and Florence certainly did. Um, really back in the days when AKC reps, all of them were supportive and they were the people that helped you. I mean, they attended most of the dog shows and they watched the people who were really good at it. And uh, you know, when you've been in the ring as long as I have, it's not hard. Although there's certainly some assignments that take your breath away. <laughs> oh, sure. You've had some amazing assignments over the years. I have. Any stick out in your, in your mind? Oh yeah, that's an easy one. Actually, there's two. The 2006 Rhodesian Ridgeback National Specialty will remain probably my most favorite judging memory. There were 600 dogs. Wow. I did 200 a day. On the final day, there were 178 specials. <laughs> and I, I, the class dogs were a couple of hundred, and I can remember thinking to myself as I slugged it out, do you really know what you're looking for? <laughs> Finally, this bred by an exhibitor dog walked in, and I thought, oh, my God, that is just beautiful. So if nothing better than this comes in, I'm going to be happy with him for Winner's Dog. Well, it turned out he was Winner's Dog and Best of Winners. Bitches were beautiful, and I ended up with a really nice overall pictured bitch, I thought. And all these specials came in. And when I was finally done, the best of breed dog and the best of opposite bitch were brother and sister. Oh. And the breed dog had sired the Winner's Dog. Oh, jeez. And he went on to be the top winning Ridgeback of all times. He was the dog that Frank Murphy had so much success with. And their sister was Winner's Bitch. And apparently there had been a whole family, some uh, Alicia Moore, the Kamani Ridgeback lady. I had never seen any of these dogs or their people, but it was just the most rewarding experience. And that will always stand out. I loved the breed. I wish I could have one, but as my daughter says, it'd have me tied up in the basement. <laughs> They're too much dog for me. <laughs> They're not all that easy. But anyway, so that was great fun. Um, and I'm going to do the Ridgeback National next year. Oh, I was supposed to, do it, supposed to do it again this year, but it got canceled. And I'm glad they canceled because I was going to. I'm not putting myself out at this time. So anyway, uh, and then of course, the 2018 Westminster Best in Show. I mean, that's, that falls in the category of be careful what you wish for. <laughs> I mean, it's a, something we all hope to be asked for. And then when it happens, you think, holy crow, <laughs> this is a lot. And that year it was even more than normal, which I didn't know because I had, had no personal experience beyond Dick Mean and being with him when he did that. Um, there was a Netflix series called Seven Days Out, mm -hmm. and there was a film crew with me for three, four days. 
they met me at the hotel. They followed me up in the elevator. They wanted to watch me unpack my suitcase. And I said no, which was a damn good idea because it opened up upside down and everything fell out. <laughs> but anyway, they were with me all the time. And then there was a, another documentary series called Crowned. And that was, do you remember the one? Uh, Tom Bradley did it first. I think I was second. And unfortunately, they didn't do it last year. It was a really well done. Where done by you Fox. that one? I've never seen that one. Yeah, it's on Fox Sports and not Fox News. <laughs> <laughs> I, told them, I told them I wouldn't let them in the door if they were with Fox News. <laughs> they were really good kids. But anyway, so I had those two things going on as well. And it was, it was very intrusive. But Westminster was really kind. They made things as easy as possible. It's a wonderful club of really good, caring people. So that was one hell of an experience. And I have to tell you, when I finally got out on the floor at 9.30 that night, I was so relieved to finally be doing what it is I do. Yeah. You know, an actress, I'm certainly not. So it was uh, quite an experience. And uh, I'm very grateful to have had that opportunity. It's been a lot of fun. And of course, Westminster has been fun for me. That was assignment number 11. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, I did, and that I had number 12 last year, or this year. It was only February of this year. But, you know, two hound groups, and as you well know, I love those hounds groups. <laughs> and uh, I got to do a terrier group. I'm sorry I never got to do a sporting group, but I've, I have no complaints. I've been really lucky. Well, you still can, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a, a tradition that once you've done best, you then just, if you're lucky, just judge breeds a game. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah, which, which is good. I, I don't disagree. I mean, it's kind of hoggy to continue on at this point. Uh, I'd like to, I would have enjoyed watching you do a sporting group, though. I enjoy watching you do sporting dogs. So. Yeah, I like them a lot. They make a lot of sense to me. Uh, are there some dogs out there that you wished you could have judged or been a part of? Hey, you know, it's interesting. I never judged Mick the carry. Okay. Isn't that funny? All the shows he was shown at. Of course, I saw him plenty of times, but I never got to have that thrill, which I would have enjoyed. Um, really, collectively, uh, I think I've judged most of the dogs that I really loved and got to have more than once. I loved that Irish setter bitch, Emily, that... Uh, Adam Bernardin showed, she always gave me a great thrill and I don't think I ever turned her down. And Matisse, the Portuguese water dog, that was always a thrill when he walked into the ring. He gave you those electric feelings. And Mystique, Mother the German, Adam <laughs> yeah, Adam. I have this connection. <laughs> and I loved Mystique, the shepherd bitch. Um, I don't think she has a Canadian connection, does she? Well, Jim is sort of Canadian. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> yep. Uh, so those, those stand out. And uh, Mystique was Canadian. She was, she was bred in Canada. Was she? Yeah. I, knew, I, I knew a couple of others down from her had been, but I had forgotten. It's a long time ago now. My God, that was early 90s. Mystique was bred in Canada. I'm sure of that, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, there may not be a lot of us, but we're pretty good at some things. The two greatest winning dogs in America, the greatest winning male is, is Matisse, and the greatest winning dog of all time is Mystique, so they're both bred in Canada. Hey, it's how about that? <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> hey, it's no surprise, you know? Yeah. Not really. We have some good dog people. Yeah, we do. We do, yeah. So uh, I've gotten to do the Golden Retriever National. I did bitches. That was a very interesting experience. I wow. loved that. And I got to do the Irish Setter National last year and Mary Merlot's beautiful bitch prevailed. And there were some really good dogs. In the end, it was tough just to pick out the awards of merit because there were so many good dogs in the well, ring. You have to give me some advice then because it's already been published. I'm judging the Irish Setter National next year. Are you? Aren't you lucky? I'm so, I'm so excited. I'm nervous, though, but I'm so excited. So. No, no, no. You'll be fine. Once you get in the middle of the ring, it all makes sense. I'm looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to it. That's been my breed since I was a kid. So, so where is it going to be? It's in Maryland next year. 
oh, that'll be good. Yeah. Crab cakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <I'm very laughs> that's, that's how I think of that. Oh, it, it's a great experience. And it's really a good club and so many nice exhibitors who seem genuinely happy for somebody else's wins. And you don't see that all the time. Um, either they're very good at it <laughs> or it's sincere. And I rather think it's the latter. Hey, I that, really enjoyed it. The, the background of the people in Iris Center as I go back to so many, like, I, like my, if I considered my person I look, look up to in Iris Center, it would be Mr. Eldridge. And he was very much that way, very much. I knew, I knew what you were going to say. <laughs> yeah, he's everybody's idol. He was a really wonderful gentleman. There's no yeah, question. The breed was lucky to have him. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's going to be a lot of fun. So are you doing bitches and intersex? I'm doing dogs intersex. Okay. Oh, excellent. All right. Well, I look forward to hearing what you do. <laughs> okay. Well, enough about me. Let's get back to you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. When you're, you must have, you've, you've judged so much. Was, was there any funny, well, I'm sure there was lots of funny moments. Does one come to mind while you were judging? Not really. I've been asked that question before. I think some of the funny things have been my dreams ahead of some of these assignments. Oh, yeah. I can remember, <laughs> I'm going to judge the roving Australian terrier specialty. And at the time, tails were a great big issue. You know, some were not docked anymore, which, of course, is happening around the world. So my dream was there was an American bred class of 16 came in and eight had tails and eight didn't. And I didn't know what the hell to do with them. <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> and I can remember Roy waking up one time saying, I just had the wildest dream. I was judging the Los Opso National, which that was his breed when I met him. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, he had uh, gotten divorced, couldn't have a St. Bernard, so somebody had given him a Lhasa. So anyway, the American bread class had 147 entries. And he couldn't make up fourth, who was going to be fourth place. And people kept picking up their dogs and shoving it at him. Pick me, pick me. <laughs> and another one, another one I had was before some big Westie event. And I can remember that half of them came in that were brown and the other half were white. And what was I going to do with those? <laughs> I had a Westie dream too. Isn't that funny? I dreamed I was showing Luke, I was helping Luke in Westies, Luke Eric. Yep. And I because up here he showed a lot of Westies. And I was showing his Westie special. And I won't say who the judge was in my dream. I guess I can't. She's 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 not here anymore, so she can't get mad at me. Anita Chapman was the judge. You remember Anita? Anita? Oh yeah. Yes, yes. Well, I always had she was she was never mean to me, but I could always see her being stern to other people in the ring. So in my dream, I was showing Luke's Westie, and she asked me if this was Luke's. I said yes, and she took out a pair of straight scissors and cut the skirt off on the table. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good one. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know what to say to Luke. I don't think I ever told Luke that either. So, so now he'll find out. <laughs> like that story. <laughs> oh boy! Next to my show to Anita Chapman, I was like, Woo. <laughs> you know, I was. I was gone from Canada in, early on in dogs, and I didn't know all the people back in those days. You know, I was very West Coast and yes. Vancouver Island and Vancouver, and uh, our, big, our big expedition of the year was driving to Portland to show at Dog Fanciers in January. First kennel club I ever belonged to was the Nanaimo Kennel Club. Oh, okay. With my initial St. Bernard going to dog training classes, and some years ago, I went back and judged Best in Show there, and I, that was a lot of fun. That was, uh, boy, Perfect. talk about full circle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that was great fun. And we, I get to judge dog fanciers on occasion now, and I was supposed to do it in January of next year. And I thought, well, I'll, make, I'll try the COVID judging, and I'd fly in, maybe drive if the weather was good wear a mask and see what I thought about doing that. And unfortunately it got canceled. Yeah, I heard so, that. Yeah, uh, that's a, got to be a big expensive facility and they probably wanted a mammoth deposit and then you have no guarantees you're gonna hold a show. 
I was there last year. They put on a very good show. Oh, they really do. And I thought they're a bunch of smart people. They're going to handle this properly. They did that didn't make me nervous, but I have to say I'm very concerned still until there's a vaccine. I don't know how much judging I'm going to do. Well, I understand. It's it's a concern for sure. Yep, I said early on I wasn't going to die because I went to a damn dog show. <laughs> well, as a as a judge, uh, do you have any advice for young judges coming up? Yes, don't go too fast. Learn your breeds to start with. Today, it's so easy to have one or two breeds and suddenly have 12 or 14. Many times over the years, our, the maximum here used to be 13 dogs, was all you could apply for. I have to tell you, a day where all 13 of those are there with decent entries, that is a real challenge. And you very quickly realize that it's a lot to take on. I have never been a great fan of Canada's system, and I know why it happens, because it's a very different entry. But um, be really careful about what you accept and what you do. So if you're licensed for half the Terrier group in Canada, don't go up accepting an invitation to Hatboro, Devon, Montgomery, because <laughs> you're going to fall on your butt. That is one Oh, absolutely overwhelming. It's overwhelming when you've been judging for a long time. And I think, you know, nobody wants to make an ass out of themselves. And you want to do a thoughtful and good job. And even if you're an American and you're, you've gone fairly slowly, it can be a daunting experience. And, you know, people spend a hell of a lot of money to get their dogs ready into the ring, make those trips. And I think each person deserves to be properly judged with some knowledge in your head. And judging some of the rare breeds like mine, you better have a picture of the right dog in your mind's eye or you're in deep trouble, exactly. very deep trouble. So I would say, slow down. Don't make the moment you're finished your provisionals, your next quest is to acquire a bunch of more breeds because we don't need more of that kind of judging. We have enough of that now. I really, really dislike what Steve Gladstone did here. His theory was anybody could judge if they got the right, right tools or the, the right map. I disagree. You know, I think there's plenty of workmanlike judges. There are some people who are truly talented. And there's no reason why a workmanlike judge can't be a good judge, but it's going to take a little more time to hone that picture in your mind's eye. And when it's in the ring, you can actually find it. You. Uh, you know, yeah. it, it's easy, easy to say don't be a fault judge, but you know, lots of times that's an easy way to solve your problem. Oh, it has a, a slightly undershot mouth. Well, I can dis disregard that dog, even though the rest of it's still a really good dog, and you're going to put up somebody's pet with a perfect mouth. Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Wrong. Exactly. You know what I think? Mr. Eldridge, he always told me to look at virtues. He was always, always on me about that. Absolutely, absolutely. For me, I think silhouette is so important. I want to stand across the ring and see the correct proportions. And, you know, it's interesting when a breed's supposed to be just square or off square, how many long, low ones you see flying around the ring. You know, you need to know that. I always remember Bob Moore writing an article for Dog News about why is it so hard to find square? <laughs> and, you know, he was quite the controversial old boy, but he was a pretty good dog man. I think he was. He really, well, yeah, he, he and uh, you couldn't mess with Bob. He was going to do what he damn well wanted to, which, you know, is good. And it's fast. Not, <laughs> oh, and fast. Oh, God help you. <laughs> you know, and that's another thing. You can be too fast, but you sure can be too slow. Oh, you know, if you, if you don't know what you're doing, get in and get out fast. <laughs> 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 I mean, I went to the ringside when Bob was judging, and I would ask him how enthusiastic he was that day, just so I could keep my schedule straight. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very good question. <laughs> yeah, said, you know, said, it's easy. Going. You know, you get to the point where they walk in, and you pretty much know what you're going to do. Yeah. But again, I go back to old Roy Stenmark's. You know, take it out far enough, let it uh, let it play out. And sometimes what you think you're going to do, you don't actually do. It's true. It's true. 
Yeah. I have one last question for you, and I'll leave you alone. <laughs> okay. If you could go back to the 20 year old Betty Ann, was there, was there any advice you would give her? Oh boy. <laughs> um, advice from the dog world? <laughs> <laughs> Could be anything. What advice would you give Betty? All right. Well, Betty Ann should have become a veterinarian is what Betty Ann should have done, <laughs> but she didn't. And that will always be a regret for me. Um, it's been an adventuresome life. I've, uh, I was thinking to myself, if I hadn't met Roy Stenmark when I did, I was probably going to marry Roy Crawford, who at the time was the Saskatchewan breed warden for the Canadian Kennel Club. Oh. He lived on Von Blucher Corners in Saskatoon. I probably would still be scrubbing out the uh, yellow marks on his sinks. <laughs> <laughs> he had St. Bernard's and Clumber Spaniels. He was quite a character and I think to myself, boy, my life would have been pretty different. But I guess all these things happen for a reason. Oh, exactly. exactly. Yep. I mean, imagine picking up and driving across Canada and the U.S. with your St. Bernard in your car. <laughs> <laughs> I'm amazed I got there. <laughs> yeah, that's a long drive. Oh my God. That was, especially in 1974. <laughs> what were you driving? Uh, Richard and Barbara's great big old truck. Wow. <laughs> and you were driving. <laughs> and I was driving. Yep. Okay, yep. I girl. <laughs> forgot what it was. <laughs> yeah. but that was quite the times. Well, this has been great. Thank you for uh, doing this for me and for us. So it was great to catch up with you. We have, we've been missing you, so it's good to see you. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that was fun, Will. Take care and good luck with your judging. Oh, thank you. You take care of yourself as well, and we'll see you somewhere, I'm sure. Yes, you bet. Bye-bye. <laughs> well, thank you, Betty Ann. It was great to see you. Make sure everything all is well out there in California. Um, it was nice to catch up as well. Hope to see you soon. Well, if you like what we're doing here, make sure you press the like, share, and subscribe button. If you want to get a hold of me, get a hold of me at dogshowtips at gmail.com. Or if you just want to find out what's happening in Will's world, go to willalexander.net. Until next time, guys. Talk to you soon.